Well, Father, we thank you for your word today, God, that we're able to dig into it and that you speak to us through your word. God, I ask that you would change our lives, touch our hearts today with your word in Jesus' name. Amen. I was uh, just reading an article this week on, on, the, on uh, Fox News, actually by Rachel Godwin, and this is uh, what she, she was talking about the churches in North Korea. And it says early, uh, and I'm going to read a little story here uh, that I want you to get. And this was the article. In early morning light, a small group of North Korean believers meet on the riverbank, lugging their fishing gear with them. Okay, Quietly, they load into a small boat and push off the land. It's not until they're far off into the middle of the river that they dare to dig through their gear and pull out their Bibles. This is a, the only place where they feel safe enough to worship together and to study God's word. And even then, they're, 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 in const, they're constantly on alert. If they're caught reading the Bible, they could immediately be sentenced to 15 years in a labor camp. Or worse. They've heard of stories, what happens to people who, who are heard speaking the name of Jesus. Many of them have family members and friends who are living in the camps right now, or have been buried there. And that's why, when another boat approaches, they panic. And they begin to scramble to hide their Bibles. And, and it's the police, someone shouts. Only after the man in the boat greets them in the name of Jesus and tells them he has a gift for them do they actually calm down. Okay? Uh, he asks to see the Bibles, and the believers who own one hand them to him. There are only a few Bibles among the church members, not nearly enough for everyone, and each copy is practically falling apart. This is actually my Bible from Bible school, and it's literally, um, I've got Luke in the beginning. And like all, all my bindings have fallen apart in this Bible. And the only reason I have it today is because I've lost my other one. Uh, but uh, it, their Bibles are falling apart, but they cherish them, okay? After years of being carefully studying and hiding them over and over again, the bindings have come loose, the pages are beginning to slip out. Many of the Bibles have uh, water damage uh, from these early morning meetings in boats, but they are still the Christian's prized possessions, okay? They risk their lives for these Bibles, and so when the stranger pulls out a box of new Bibles provided by the generous world help donors, which is another organization kind of like the Gideons, um, there's an immediate celebration on the boat, and the believers clutch the word of God in their chests, and many of the people who have never had one previously break down into tears because they have God's word in their hand. To them, the new Bible is the greatest gift that anyone could give them. Okay? There's still countless of believers across this dark nation who are desperate for Bibles. Some, Bible, some people have never even seen a copy of the scripture in their lifetime, but they now would do anything to get their hands on it. So after the man delivers the new Bibles, he, go, he, goes, back, um, uh, he goes back to the hotel where he's staying, and he hides them in the hotel. But soon afterwards, they disappear, and he, he's like, hey, I've hid these Bibles. Where are they? They're not here. And he later discovers a janitor has found the Bibles. Instead of reporting them, he took them, and it turns out he was a Christian himself, and his tiny house church of four people have been praying, God, send us Bibles. <laughs> and so he prays God for the Bible, even as damaged and falling apart as they were, because he and his friends now uh, could finally study God's word for themselves. And that's how desperate the North Korean church is for Bibles. Okay, And so we need to be praying for our brothers and sisters in North Korea. I, I believe you'll do that with me. Um, Father, we lift up uh, our brothers and sisters in North Korea, Lord. We pray that you would send laborers into the harvest field, God, and that you'd send Bibles, Father, to them in Jesus' name. And so how precious sh should God's word be to us? Okay, People around the world are risking their lives to read the word because they understand that the word is powerful. The Word of God, if you read it in its context and you believe it and you have faith in the Scripture, it is living and it's powerful. It's able to change you. It's able to set your course straight. It's able to bring healing in your life. And, and, and people around the world understand this and they risk their lives to read this Bible, even at the punishment of death. But here in North America, it's different. We've become indifferent to it. Right? We've become, it's all about, well, we want to be relevant and we want to be politically correct so we won't say what the scripture says. But I want to say this the word of God, we need to cherish this book. Amen? Because it has the power to change our lives. Some are dying for the word. And my question today is are we willing to live for it? Amen? We're not in a, in a state politically where we have to lay down our lives for the scripture, but are we willing to live to follow God's word? Okay, I believe everybody here today is spiritually hungry. You want to grow and to mature and to pursue.
the presence of God. Now, I want to read the scripture in Jude chapter 1, verse 3 to 4, because we're given this exhortation. And I think we're dealing with the same things the early church dealt with. How many know there's nothing new under the sun? And here's what Jude says. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly. Say, contend earnestly. For the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Okay? For certain men have crept in unnoticed. Okay? Certain men have crept into the church long ago who were marked out for condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of God into lewdness and deny the only Lord and God, our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the word lewdness in the King James is lasciviousness, okay? And it actually means this, licentiousness, sorry. It means lacking in willpower or moral discipline. So certain people are creeping into the church and say, you know, it's not about your, your discipline. It's not about moral values. It's just about grace. It's just about what God can do for you and what God can do for your life. There's no requirement on your end. And the Bible says that this is ungodliness, okay? There's, there's a lacking of willpower and moral dis- discipline, discipline. It also means to be promiscuous, to have sex outside of marriage, or it could also mean to willingly to conform to accepted rules or an unwillingness. And so there's people that say, I, I can't conform to what God's word says. I just, you know, I want to go to church. I want to call God my savior. I want to call Jesus Lord, but I don't want to conform my life to what the word of God says. And I'm here to say this. When we conform our lives to the God's rules, if you want to say that, we get a better life out of it. God's not out to take something from us. God is out to give us life and life in abundance, right? Because the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus came to give life. He wants to give you an abundant life, and there's nothing better than freedom in Christ. There's there's no greater place than to be in relationship with God, okay? And so I wanted to read a passage of Scripture here in Hebrews chapter 3. Say Hebrews chapter 3. It's a powerful chapter, verse 13. Okay, it says this. I'm going to start in verse 12, actually. It says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And I want to say this, um, that God calls a, an unbelieving heart evil, right? We're not talking about the Ten Commandments right now. We're not talking about, you know sin and in, in, in what we do to offend God. We're talking about just our heart saying, I, I choose not to believe you. Look what it says in verse 12. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Okay? We, we don't want to depart from the living God. Because, um, I'm going to keep reading here, but exhort one another daily, say daily, See, daily we got to be exhorting one another, we got to be encouraging one another daily, while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, okay? And um, sin will actually harden your heart. Well, what does it mean when your heart is hardened? Well, it's hard to pray. It's hard to read the Bible. It's hard to worship God. It's hard to love your neighbor. It, every, it becomes hard. Why? Because your heart has, has gotten hard, Amen? The good news is that God, in one moment, can just soften it if we humble ourselves. Amen? And, and God wants us to, to believe him because sin is deceitful. It'll take you farther than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will destroy your life. All right? And so we want to live right before God. Okay? Now, as we're reading through this chapter, I'm not going to read it all. Um, it's talking about the children of Israel and how they went with Moses. Moses led them out of Egypt and they're going to the promised land and God wanted to give them rest. Say rest. rest. But in order to have rest, they had to do one thing. They had, to, they had to go to war and they had to press through their enemies, right? And as they pressed through their enemies and they defeated the giants, they de- defeated you know, the, the enemies in the land, they were going to sit in homes they never built, they were going to eat from gardens they never planted, they were going to be able to sit back and eat a pomegranate and enjoy peace and rest. All they had to do was they had to make a decision to believe God because God says, listen, surely I'm with you. You shall go forth and you sh- everywhere where you set the foot of your, your, your feet, I'm going to give you that land to possess. I'm with you. 
And they saw the miracles of God parting the Red Sea. They seen God's provision and they saw, but they chose not to believe. They chose to believe fear instead of faith. And because they didn't believe God, they were not able to enter the promised land and have rest. And I want to say this today as believers, as New Testament believers, we have to, by the grace of God, be willing to fight some giants in our lives. And on the other side of those giants is rest. Can you hear amen? See, God wants you to be at rest. He wants us as believers to be at rest. But it's gonna, you, you need to fight your battles. You need to deal with your demons. You've got to deal with the giants that are coming against your life. And when, you, when you're willing to say, God, by your grace and with your strength, I'm going to deal with these issues, and you, you, you believe what God has to say about you, you'll defeat the giants, and you'll sit at rest. Is that good news? Okay? But many people don't want to fight their giants. They say, you know, I'm just going to believe God, that God is going to take care of it for me. No. He's given you the responsibility to fight your own battles. Now, he gives us strength and he helps us, but the battle belongs to the Lord working through us, okay? So, I want to go to another scripture here. I'm just passing through these here. Um, So, let's go down to chapter 4, verse 11, Brian, if we can bring us down there. Okay? Let us... Therefore, be diligent to enter that rest. See, we've got to be diligent to enter this rest. Lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Okay? Because the children of Israel, they were disobedient. They didn't believe that God could use them, that God was with them, and they chose not to go against the enemy. Let us, therefore, be diligent to do what? To enter rest. But say, in order for me to enter rest, say it, for me to enter rest, I have to push through the enemy. Okay, and how many know we got an enemy, right? The enemy of our soul who comes and tempts us. And, and, and when we overcome, the Bible says, when we overcome temptation, he gives us the crown of life. And we're able to live in victory. Okay? But we need to overcome. Okay? And so, let's look at what the word says in Hebrews chapter 4, um, Verse 11, let us therefore be diligent to enter the rest, lest any one fall according to the same example of disobedience. Verse 12, for the word of God is living and powerful. Say living and powerful. And sharper than two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So here it is. The Word of God, first and foremost, comes in and it divides your soul and spirit. So when the Word of God comes, if you read the Scripture, it actually brings a division so you can say, okay, this is my mind, this is my emotions, this is my will, and this is what my spirit wants, and this is what the Holy Spirit say, and you begin to discern between what's carnal and what's of God. That's what the Word of God says. If you will read the Word, it comes to divide what is of the soulish realm and what is of the spirit realm. The Bible says that it gets so deep into us that it gets into the joints and marrow. The deepest part of who you are as a person is your marrow. It gets right into the depths of your body. We just did a course on highway to wholeness, and we're teaching that as you obey God's Word, it brings healing in your life, physical healing. Okay, And the word of God gets into the joint and the marrow. Number three, it's the discerner of our thoughts and the intentions of our heart. God's word will begin to reveal our motives and how we're doing And so we can, we can grow in our, our development. And then number four, it says it finds critters. Say critters. So if there's a, de- a demonic influence working through your life, it actually finds that. Did you know that? It's actually in the Bible. We'll read the next verse, and it says, verse 13, And there is no creature hidden from his sight. Okay? But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him who we must give an account. So if there's, if there's a creature that's man, if there's jealousy coming through your life, if there's envy or strife coming through your life, the, God's word finds it in your life and rips it out. Amen? But if you're not in the word of God, you'll never see it. You guys don't believe me? Okay, let me give you some scripture background here. Okay, okay. Let's go to James chapter 3. James chapter 3, verse 13 to 14. You guys okay? All right, everyone's okay. 
Who is wise and understanding among you? Let me see your hands. Are you wise? Understanding? Hands up. There's a few of you. One, two, three. Come on, guys. You're wise because you're here listening to me. So put your hand up. There we go. Okay. So this is for people that, that, that want wisdom and understanding. He's speaking to the church. And James says, let him show by good conduct that his works are done in humility of wisdom. So what he's saying here is that we have works that God has prepared for us that he wants us to do. And he wants good conduct in our life. Okay. Next verse. But if you have bitter envy, say bitterness, or envy, or self-seeking, in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. Next verse says, okay, next verse. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing is there. So if there's strife in your life, if there's envy in your life, if there's jealousy in your life, uh, and you're not dealing with it, the enemy has access to your life, right? That's really, really scary. So what do we do? We deal with it, okay? The Bible says in verse 15, verse 15, because we're talking about wisdom, this wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. So the demonic stuff can manifest through our lives. How many know what I'm talking about? And so, so God wants to, the word of God to come and deal with that in our lives. And we have to allow God's word to do that. Okay? Many Christians refuse to believe that demonic spirits can work through them. So I don't believe in that. I believe once you're saved, you're set free. Most of these Christians usually end up on a couch with a psychotherapist who has been taught to deal with archetypes and dark shadows of your ancestral past, which was taught by Carl Jung, who was a a psychiatrist. But actually, his teachings came from his spirit guides because he was into Eastern mysticism. And so, you know, you don't want to believe that the power of God can set you free. Now you're sitting at a psychotherapist's office trying to get help through spirit guides. Okay, this is just amazes me. All right. James chapter 3, verse 17 says, But the wisdom from above is first pure, it's peace-loving, gentle at all times. And I'm not against psychotherapists, by the way. I'm just saying that, yeah, I'm not against counseling and all that kind of stuff. But the wisdom that is from above is pure, it's also peace-loving, gentle at all times, willing to yield to others. It's full of mercy, full of good fruits and deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. So God's wisdom is, number one, First of all, pure. Number two, it's peace-loving. Number three, it's gentle at all times. Number four, it's willing to yield to others. Number five, it shows no, part- no favoritism. And it's always sincere. Sounds like the fruit of the Spirit. And so when God's wisdom is coming, it's producing the fruit of the Spirit. When wisdom that is coming that is creating strife and envy and jealousy and bitterness and outbursts of wrath, it's demonic. And that's why Paul tells us to take every thought captive, be the master of your own mind, filter what's coming in and say, no, that's not of God. Yes, this is of God. And you begin to think about what you're thinking about so you can walk in victory. Does this make sense to you guys? Okay, so to enter rest, you need to defeat some giants in your life. And so I want to talk for 10 minutes about a giant that we need to deal with in our lives. Go with me to Psalm 139, 139, verse 23. Is anyone hot in here? Okay, perfect. I'm glad you're happy. (laughs) Whew. Now, this is David. Now, you know King David, right? Um, he did a lot of great things um, for God. And I, and I think we're going to look at some keys to why he was able to, okay? He says here, search me, O God, and know my heart. Now, we're going to actually go to verse 13, Brian, please. Verse 13. Okay? For you form my inward parts. David's having a conversation with God. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, that sounds pretty cocky. But it's not. It's confidence. 
He understood, hey, God, you, you have made me fearfully and wonderfully, and my soul knows it very well. Now look at this next verse. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully made in the lowest parts. of the- I was skillfully made. He was very confident in who he was. Now look at this. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in my book they were all written, the days fashioned for me when as yet none of them were. Verse 17. How precious also are your thoughts of me, O God. Do you know that God has thoughts of you? He, he has precious thoughts towards you. He thinks about you. He loves you. If I could count them, they would be more in number than the sand of the sea. And when I awake, I'm still with you. And, 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 and the key is verse 14. If we go back to verse 14, I want to read this again. It says, Marvelous are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My question is, does your soul, does your mind, does your emotions, does your will, do you think all the time, I'm marvelous. God did a good job in making me. Do you think that way? Because false humility says, you know, low is me, I'm just a worm, I'm no good for nothing, God, you know, by God's grace, he could use, that's, that's false humility. True humility is to say that I'm important to God, and so are you. you. You're on equal playing field with people. It's not when you put yourself under, that's false humility. And David understood, hey, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, marvelous, uh, marvelously made, and, and your thoughts, God, you think about me all day, and you have great thoughts, and you're, you made me so skillfully, and you, you're, when I wake up, you're with me, God, and oh, there's a giant, he wants to take out the, hey, God's with me. I'll take this uncircumcised giant, out. I'll take him out. A bear is going to come up, okay, I'm going to show the bear the power of God in me, because I'm skillful. I'm fearfully made. And there was a confidence in David because he knew the heart of God because he was a man after God's what? As he was searching the heart of God, he saw that God had a heart for him. And so what the spirit of rejection does is it comes up in you and and you start to feel like, you know, I'm not worthy. God doesn't love me. You know, I was adopted, so I wasn't loved. I wasn't wanted. So, But none of that mattered to David. David said, hey, in sin, my mother conceived me. I was born out of wedlock. But that doesn't matter. God still loves me. He knew my, he knew my destiny. He knew what he was going to do with me. And I think that it's, um, rejection is the feeling of not being wanted or not being accepted. And God wants you to know that you are accepted. You are loved. It doesn't matter about your situation. It doesn't matter how you feel about yourself. We have to choose to believe what God's word says. Say, God's word says I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. All right? Say, God's word says that he loves me so much that even when I was a rotten sinner, he died for me and he pursued me. And you know what amazes me, guys, is you get, become a Christian and you, you feel this, this amazing cleansing on the inside and you feel like your sins are washed away and you feel the love of God. How many hear what I'm saying? And within six months to a year, God's got, the enemy's got you feeling like more guilty than before you were a Christian. Because you're listening to the spirit of rejection instead of listening to the spirit of God who says you are accepted in the beloved. Amen? David's strength came from understanding that God loved him and had a destiny for his life. All right? But you don't understand, Pastor. You don't understand the rejection I've dealt with. You don't understand what happened to me, how I was abused in high school, or when this situation You don't understand. I was always the, the, the student who was last picked on the baseball team. Or You know, you have your story. We all have our story. And the truth is, I don't understand, but Jesus does. In fact, the scripture tells us in Isaiah... 53 verse 3, he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows. The very people he came to save and heal and deliver rejected him and put him on a cross. He was acquainted with the deepest grief. You think you've experienced grief. He experienced the deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and, he lo- and, and, and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. 
And you know what? Jesus didn't raise up the grave, walking around with his shoulders down, going, you know, I'm such a loser. Nobody loves me. He said, no. I'm the firstborn among many brethren. And I, I'm going to forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They're being influenced in their thoughts through the demonic kingdom. And I'm just going to love them through it. I'm going to accept them through it. This is the love of our God. Right? He's been rejected. He understands what you've been through. He's been through it. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says, Jesus was tempted in a couple ways. Is that what it says? Jesus was tempted in every way, yet without sin. And he was tempted. So that means that if he was tempted and overcome, guess what? We can as well. And you know what? We're going to fall. We're going to make mistakes. We're on a journey, and that's okay, because the next scripture tells us in Proverbs 24, 16, says, the godly may trip seven times, but they get up again. But one disaster is enough to overthrow the wicked. How many here have fallen before? How many have the strength to get up again? Why? Because the spirit of grace. And God says, whispers in your ear, you can do it. Get up again. I've forgiven you, and, and, and my mercy endures forever. He says, come boldly to the throne room of grace and obtain mercy in time of need, because I believe in you. Even if you don't believe in yourself, I believe in you. Gideon was in, in the wine press, the least of his family, the least of his tribe. He was the loser, capital L, on the forehead, in the, that's, you know, in the well, grinding grain where no one can find him so he can feed his family. And the, the angel appears to him and says, you are a mighty man of valor. And his, his mouth drops. He's like, a mighty man of valor? Do you not know who I am? Oh, yeah, I created you. And, I pre and it doesn't matter what society says or what, what tragedy the enemy sets up to make you feel like a loser. God believes in you. And if we will be willing to believe what God says about us, and any thought that doesn't line up with the thoughts that God has, if we put them down, we'll begin to have victory over our giants. We'll begin to have victory over our temptations because the love of God will become so real to us. Amen? Can I give you one more scripture? A couple more? Romans chapter 8, verse 15 says, So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father. So I want you to say this, say, my God is my daddy, and he cares about me, and he's going to get me to my destination. And when you understand this, how much God loves you, then you begin to read the Bible differently. When you read Jonah, I was thinking about Jonah the other day. Here's Jonah. God speaks to him and says, hey, son, I want you to go and prophesy in Nineveh and tell them that they need to repent. And Jonah's like... Sorry, God, that's a big one. He hides off, gets in a boat, and he's like, I'm going in my own direction. And he goes off into the boat, and then the storms come, and he's out of the will of God, and he's come out from under God's protection. He's in disobedience. And the people on the boat are saying, hey, who's causing this storm? Who's in rebellion to God? And they, oh, it, it's Jonah. So they cast him off the boat to save their lives. And God is like, oh, great. Now, I'm just going to send a submarine. Do, 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 do. And this whale just kaboof, takes him and says, like, I'm going to deliver him to where he's supposed to be. Because I want him in my perfect will. And he goes in a submarine ride, the first submarine ride, all the way over to Nineveh. <laughs> and I could see the Ninevites who worship Dagon, the, the fish god, was actually a fish god. That they worshiped this fish god. They had, a, you know, they had these idols of fishes and everything. And this whale comes up on the shore and this, this guy comes flying out. And he's all full of digestive juice. He's probably like bleached white. Comes out of the belly of a fish and goes, you must repent. They're like, yes, yes, we will, we will, we will repent. This man came out of a fish. And, and, and it's like God is like, hey, listen, you know, I'm just, I love you so much. I'm not going to let you miss my will. And that's why the Bible says that all things work out for those that love him. And if you love God, you don't have to worry because he's going to work it all out. He's going to take you. He's, you say, I'm going to go in there. No, he'll get you by the ear and pull you the other way. Why? Because he loves us. Amen. 
and he redirects us and he resets us because he wants you more than you want to. He wants you to reach your destination. He wants you to fulfill your purpose. All right? One last scripture in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 to 6. It says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, God knew you before the foundations of the world. That's pretty cool. Our brains can't figure that one out. That we should be holy and without blame before him in a love relationship, in love, having predestined us to be adopted as sons and daughters to himself. He was thinking about you before you were born. You know, one day, you know, Alex is going to be living. Uh, Pierre, I don't know if Alex is. Uh, there's Alex. And you know what? I, I, I'm going to set, set something out, a situation where, you know, the Spirit of God is going to speak to his heart, and he's going to accept me, and I'm, I'm so excited because he's going to become my kid. He's going to come into my family, and the Satan's power will be broken off his life, right? And I could use any of us as an example of that, I'm not picking on Alex. But the point is, God, prede- he, he was looking forward to it. Okay, according to the good pleasure of his will. Say, it's God's good pleasure to have me in his family. Okay, to the praise the glory of his grace by which he, he made us accepted in the beloved. I want you to say, I'm accepted in the body of Christ. And so what happens is now the enemy will come and try to even use scripture to bring you into condemnation. And think, oh man, you know, God doesn't love me and I've messed up too many times. And, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe God feels the way my parents felt about me. And you, st- and you start thinking and reasoning and it's contrary to the word of God. And I'm here to say, as we started this morning, the children that came, the Hebrews that came out under Moses' leadership, God was saying, hey, listen, I want to give you the land. You can do it. I'm with you. You know, I'm going to go with you. And they're like, no, we'd rather listen to this fear we're experiencing and we're just going to pull back. And I'm here to say that God loves you. God has a purpose for you. Anything that doesn't sound like a father talking to a son and daughter, loving you with a heart for you, is probably not God. Amen? Let's stand together. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And um, then we're going to open up the altars for prayer ministry. Dom, would you just come up and play something for us? Just on the guitar. Amen. So if this message spoke to you, just I want you just to pray this with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you that you care for me. I thank you that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm marvelous. You love me. You have a plan and destiny for my life. Help me to recognize any thoughts that would come to belittle myself. Because you have not rejected me. You have accepted me. Help me to live a life that is pleasing unto you and that sets you as the Lord of my life. And I'll choose to repent of any sin that is going to deceive me and pull me away from your loving arms and your embrace in Jesus' name. And then if you're in this place and you've never accepted the Lord, we'll all pray together. And you want to accept the Lord. Every eye, every eye bowed, every head bowed, every eye closed. Just lift your hands and say, I want to accept the Lord today. I want to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah, I see your hands. I see your hands. I see your hands at the back. I want you to pray this with me. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me so much that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for me. I want to receive him as my Lord and Savior. Send your Holy Spirit to live in my heart and to change my life. In Jesus' name. The Bible says if we call upon the name of the Lord, we will be saved. Amen.